Hi everyone and welcome back to Philosophy of Cognitive Science with me, Dr. Josh Redstone. In today's somewhat overdue lecture, we will be wrapping up our discussion of dynamics. So this is dynamics part two, and uh, well, let's start with a little bit of recap. So last time when we covered part one of chapter seven from Andy Clark's Mindware, we looked at dynamic systems theory predominantly. Uh, whoops. We looked at dynamic systems theory for the most part, and a little bit, um, a little bit of dynamic field theory. Of course, we didn't get into any of the mathematics because those are well beyond the scope of the class and beyond my training. But we got a sense of how dynamic systems theory may help us to explain the mind, at least in terms of low-level um, perception and action. Uh, and problem solving related to perception and action. We also learned a little bit about the type of complexity that dynamic systems theory is suited for explaining or modeling. This kind of complexity has certain features, right? We talked about four key features. Um, low level, um, you know, any kind of complexity where uh, powerful but low level descriptions of systemic unfolding uh, any kind of complexity like that lends itself to a dynamic analysis, for example. And here we're talking about things like Boyd flocking or convection rolls in frying pans, of course. Uh, intuitive geometric images of the state space of the system. We saw this a little bit last time when we talked about attractors and repellers and bifurcations within the state space. Indeed, the state space itself, or if you like, the dynamic field, is one of those geometric... Um, one of those geometric images, right? Uh, kind of like if you're familiar with physics and you want to talk about uh, Albert Einstein's work, right? Relativity, gravity, all of that cool stuff. You can talk about it just in terms of math, or you can envision space-time as a sheet with gravity wells in it and uh, so on and so forth. I'm sure you're familiar with what I mean. We can do something similar here in dynamic systems theory, where we try to um, use intuitive geometric uh, uh, visualizations to capture the complexity that we're trying to describe. Um, the kind of complexity where if we use dynamic analysis, we can isolate control parameters, define collective variables. That kind of complexity is suited to the dynamic analysis. We saw this uh, last time as well. Uh, particularly with the walk governor, um, uh, walking as well, uh, the swinging pendulums on the wall, and finally the use of the notion of coupling. Um, this is especially pertinent when it comes to the walk governor, because as we saw, the, the arm angle and the throttle valve, the extent to which the throttle valve is open or closed, uh, those are coupled in the case of the Watt governor. Similarly with the synchronizing, uh, self-synchronizing pendulums on the wall uh, that synchronize due to vibrations running along the wall. We can analyze that as a coupled system. So that's, those are the sorts of features that uh, the kinds of complexity that we can understand with dynamic systems theory uh, has. And just to go over... Um, or, or rather the kinds of complexity that we can study using the tools of dynamic systems theory, I should say. And just to go over, um, uh, just to recap a little bit more, remember we saw all of this kind of play out in different cases like rhythmic finger motion. Uh, I briefly mentioned treadmill stepping, the watt governor, of course, preservative reaching, and the A not B error. So last time we kind of uh, saw all of those features of complexity uh, at various points in our discussion of, of those four examples where um, researchers have actually brought the tools of dynamic systems theory to bear on low-level uh, perception action problem solving, right? Today what we're going to do is briefly take up some of the concerns with dynamics that are raised in the later half of Chapter 7. Um, and of course, uh, fair warning, uh, the slides are a little bit less dense today, so I might be riffing a little bit more than usual. Be sure to take notes if you find that helpful. All right, so let's get started with um, the hidden premise. That is, um, that is point of discussion A in Clark's Chapter 7. Let's take a look now. 
So if you remember from the start of last week's lecture, we kicked things off with a little bit of discussion uh, concerning this uh, inner symbol flight, what Clark calls inner symbol flight. As we move from the classical traditional symbolic picture of minds and mentation to connectionism to dynamics, we lose the emphasis or the importance that's placed on neat, discrete inner items, mental representations, right? Um, this kind of rears its head again at this point in the chapter where Clark introduces something called the radical embodied cognition thesis. Just before I explain what this is, explain, I uh, better explain embodied cognition. And embodied cognition I've kind of sort of gestured at before, mentioned in passing. A lot of what we've been talking about lately would count as embodied cognition. Cognition that does not just involve some kind of symbolic control system, uh, but uh, that, um, you know, takes advantage of the musculoskeletal properties of the body and the environmental features in order to problem solve. So think of, uh, you know, uh, when we talked about uh, robots briefly, think about Asimo versus a passive dynamic walker, right? A passive dynamic walker takes advantage of its bodily form and the environment in order to save energy, uh, and it's also representation sparse, right? So that's embodied cognition when um, not just the mind, but the body and the environment are taken into account when it comes to uh, problem solving, intelligence, understanding these things, and so forth. So the radical embodied cognition thesis is this, and you can find this on page 151 of Clark. Structured, symbolic, representational, and computational views of cognition are mistaken. Embodied cognition is best suited, uh, or sorry, <laughs> embodied cognition is best studied using non-computational and non-representational ideas and explanatory schemes, and especially the tools of dynamic systems theory. Okay, that's the radical embodied cognition thesis. And uh, many dynamicists seem to support an idea, if not this exact idea, at least something close to it. But Clark thinks it's surprising that we find such sweeping conclusions given the state of the art of the research. Uh, after all, low-level sensory motor engagements are suited for explanation by dynamic systems theory. We've seen this, and I think this chapter very nicely lays this out, along with the previous chapter. So, and heck, even the chapter before that, actually. So chapters 5, 6, and 7 all highlight this idea that low-level, so we're talking rudimentary representation sparse kind of direct uh, sense act cycles, um, the kinds of things we're talking about when we're talking about passive walkers or robot crickets or an infant uh, treadmill stepping, you know, it's, it's, its leg acts like a spring and it just has to make contact with the treadmill in the right way for walking behavior to emerge. These are suited to explanation with dynamic systems theory, of course, but the standard framework, that is the traditional framework, uh, symbolic representations, rules, mental representations, or nice discrete inner items, that, Clark thinks, may still be the best for understanding higher level cognition. And we'll see this kind of unfold further as we discuss all of these different um, points of discussion. Even at low levels of analysis, Clark maintains, some aspects of the traditional approach um, can still provide rewarding analysis. Right? So even if we can explain something non-representationally, non-computationally using the tools of dynamics, um, maybe we don't have to do that necessarily. We don't have to forget that it's also possible to explain such low-level interactions symbolically, and it remains an empirical question whether such low-level systems in nature are realized non-symbolically or not. Right? So. Nonetheless, a lot of the thinkers that we've covered in this chapter, like Felon and Smith or Kelso, are sympathetic to the radical thesis. But what do we need to do with all of this? I mean, we're not really going to try to adjudicate between the radical thesis and the standard uh, view, but Clark does think that 
there are some things that we need to keep in mind uh, as we make our way uh, into this new and interesting area in the cognitive sciences. What Clark thinks needs to happen here is that we need to do a better job of connecting the dots uh, between the empirical work and the radical conclusions of the radical thesis. So if you're a supporter of the radical thesis, you know, there's a hidden premise in there. Uh, or rather, actually, that's not a good way to put it. The hidden premise is really the radical thesis kind of inserted between uh, the observations that dynamicists have made uh, and, um, you know, this idea that uh, we can capture all of this, I suppose, non-symbolically and non-computationally. Um, in any case, we need to connect the dots between the conclusions of the radical thesis and the empirical work that has been done. The best way to do this, Clark proposes, might be to use an idea that we've already encountered, and that idea is the continuity thesis, the idea that there is a continuity between life and between mind. Um, you know, perhaps, perhaps the way we look at this uh, is, um, perhaps the way that the traditional view guides the way we look at mentation and cognition and the mental is wrong. Um, even though the idea of computation, representation, so on and so forth, even though those ideas may not actually be wrong. I'll try to clarify this with an analogy that you can find in this chapter from uh, Pollock in a 1994 publication, and he makes the analogy with flight. So think back in the day when humans were trying to achieve flight. They would look at uh, birds in nature flying, you know, and they see that they flap their wings. Um, insects, too, and bats for that matter, right? The salient feature of flight seemed to be wing flapping for, you know, early, um, early pioneers uh, of flight, you know. Uh, we're talking pre-Wright brothers here. But this isn't what's really important for flying, at least not when it comes to artificial flight, like with an airplane or a glider. What's more important is the aileron principle. The aileron principle is this idea that we need to use a control system of some kind to raise and lower wing flaps on the airplane, not to flap like a bird, um, but just so that the pilot can control the aircraft as it is flying through the air or gliding through the air. Now, according to Pollock, the flapping is like symbolic cognition. It's an obvious piece of the puzzle, but it's kind of like the last piece of the puzzle. What's more important for birds and airplanes are probably a lot of representation sparse, um, passive dynamics, um, interactions between a bodily form and the environment. These are what are more important for flight. And these similar kinds of dynamics uh, may be more important for cognition, too, at least explaining how it works. But flapping is still important, and symbolic cognition may still be important. But it's kind of like later on that continuity spectrum, right? So uh, the saliency of symbols and symbolic cognition uh, obscures cognition um, it obscures what's actually what's going on, right? Cognition is a control system that doesn't, you know, work like some kind of homunculus in someone's head or some kind of um, character in a, in a giant robot controlling a giant robot. It's really uh, more like a system that governs complex real-time interactions uh, within the system itself and between the system and the world, a bit like a Watt governor, right? So anyway... Um, Symbol systems may still be useful here, they just might not be the whole story. Uh, the dynamic approach might illustrate the fundamentals of the story. Higher level cognition, perhaps, is still best explained using the tools of the traditional approach. And that brings us back to the idea of strong and weak continuity, and this is point of discussion B. So let's take a look at point of discussion B now. The radical thesis is rooted in an observation that we've already made in this class, and that is that higher level cognitive systems are probably built upon older, more evolutionarily basic cognitive systems. 
Now, both connectionists and dynamicists make this point, but connectionists do it without calling into question the ideas of computation and representation. At least, they do question them. They question the traditional notions of computation and representation, but they don't deny their existence. They just say that, well, computation and representation are different than we thought they were. But dynamicists kind of question whether we even need these notions in the first place, because we're not dealing with sense, think, act cycles, they deal more with direct sense, act cycles, kind of like the new roboticists do. Of course, in doing so, dynamicists are emphasizing uh, interaction, reciprocal causation, coupling, all of this stuff, you know, things like ongoing uh, couplings between the, um, the environment uh, the, the body, the mind, different perceptual and cognitive systems in the mind, and all of these influence one another and are influenced by each other, right? But none of this, uh, even if all of this is true, actually establishes the radical thesis, according to Clark. You know, and to see why, you can just con consider a far less radical claim of solving problems using you know, something like an offline model, an offline stand-in um, for, uh, for environmental stimuli, right? If cognition and perception and problem solving all boils down to these mind-body-world couplings that are influencing and being influenced um, all at the same time, then how do we explain offline reasoning? Reasoning when I'm not... Um, directly engaged with the environment. You know, perhaps a dynamicist can explain how, you know, um, an expert Tetris player plays Tetris in an embodied sort of way, or how, how a clerk at the grocery store packs a grocery bag uh, in the most, uh, you know, efficient kind of way, using some kind of embodied approach. But what if you were doing a problem like that offline? Um, uh, you know, a great example, uh, I, I just finished watching that Netflix series, The Queen's Gambit. Uh, you know, offline reasoning is kind of like when she plays chess in her mind, right? And chess grandmasters really can do this, by the way. They can use their fusiform face area uh, to recognize chess patterns and have offline chess games. Um, chess grandmasters can play entire games with one another without a chessboard, okay? Very cool stuff. How do we explain that? If cognition is all about these dynamic interactions, uh, how do we reason offline? Well, um, we just take those systems that we use when we are engaged with the environment and we just use them offline. We use them like a model. And that would seem to me, and I think to Clark as well, to count as a mental representation, even if it's built upon this more basic um, much more dynamic system, right? So, um, you know, this is continuous in a certain way, continuous in, uh, discontinuous in other ways. It's representational in some ways and non-representational in, in some ways. It depends how you slice it up. And really, um, a lot of these are open questions, right? How best ought we tackle or how ought we tackle the question of offline reasoning? It seems like we need some kind of representations. Are these representations just, um, you know, using these systems, these cognitive and perceptual systems that we normally couple with the body and the world? Are we just using them offline? And is that how we get our mental representations? Uh, who knows? These are open questions. Good stuff to think about and good stuff to perhaps consider for a critical response or an essay, if you like. Very briefly to go over the next point of discussion, which is representation and computation again, um, Clark points out that what dynamicists are skeptical of or what they tend to be skeptical of where representations are concerned are what you might call objectivist representations or um, viewer-independent, finely detailed models of the world, you know, kind of, um, you know, the snapshot connection of reality, the sort of picture of the world in your head, those kinds of finely detailed models. But Clark points out that internal representations 
don't have to be of this kind. They could be of a kind that's geared towards, um, you know, supporting the kinds of real-world, real-time actions that dynamicists study. So, again, there might be representations, they just might not look like representations look on a sort of traditional or classical uh, picture. So, much of the skepticism in dynamics, uh, at least where dynamics studies the mind, is aimed at objectivist representations. You know, the kind of semantically transparent representations we talked about uh, back when we were looking at physical symbol systems. But these are not the only kinds of representations there are, right? We've already encountered lots of different kinds of representations from the sub-symbolic distributed superpositional representations of um, connectionism. And perhaps there are other uh, kinds of representations that are quite different from the objectivist, semantically transparent sort that we find in the classical uh, symbolic paradigm, uh, but which nonetheless support the kind of dynamic interactions that dynamicists are interested in studying, right? So um, I'm not going to go into much more detail here, uh, but um, that is just something uh, I thought that I should leave you with before we move on to the next point, which is the space of reasons. So here Clark points out that one of the biggest problems with anti-representationalism, you know, the kind of anti-representationalism we find in dynamics or in uh, the new robotics, um, is the treatment of the brain as just another factor in this kind of uh, larger, larger causal web, you know, that's part of the body and the world and the environment as well. In one sense, this is true, to be sure, but in another sense, it's clearly false. Um, humans with our brains, and indeed other thinking creatures in the world, non-human animals and so forth, are not like swinging pendulums or convection rolls in important ways. And the ways in which we're different from these kinds of phenomena that we can model with the tools of dynamic systems theory seem to all have something to do with brains as a kind of control system. So what do we do? What do we do here? So how do we do justice to this distinction between uh, physical causal systems, which dynamicists are interested in, and knowledge-based systems, which um, fit more within the traditional picture within the cognitive scientists, or within the cognitive sciences? Well, some dynamicists um, would deny that there is any such difference at all. Um, but if we do this, there's a worry that we'll fail to do justice to many of the different kinds of behaviors that we as thinking agents express. You know, for example, uh, and this is my example, this is not Clark's. Um, if, we, if we just think of everything as a physical causal system, that would, uh, you know, we could still explain something like goal-oriented behavior, like the behavior of Gray Walter's tortoises, right? But what about the selection of a particular goal over another? If you're a tortoise, uh, even the selection uh, between the goal of moving toward a light source and going towards your charging station is quite uh, simple, and we could explain that with a dynamic approach. But how would I explain um, my decision to record this lecture versus practice the guitar versus um, going to the park uh, to take some pictures of the birds, right? That seems less amenable to a dynamic explanation uh, if you're one of those dynamicists that think that there is no real difference between physical causal systems and knowledge-based systems. Maybe a solution here, Clark says, is dynamic computationalism. So here, details of the flow of information would be just as important uh, as the dynamics, and that flow could perhaps be understood with the tools of the computational approach. Um, that is very much an open question for Clark. All right, let's turn to the next point of discussion, richer dynamics for preservative reaching. All right, let's bring it back to preservative reaching and the A not B error. If you remember from last time, uh, Esther Thelen and colleagues created a dynamic field model of this error that the infants make. You know, they reach for something several times that's been placed in location A, 
The experimenter moves it into location B in full view of the infant. The infant sees this, yet reaches for location A, even though the infant knows the uh, toy is in location B. That's the A not B error. Uh, that's the name of the error. The phenomenon is called preservative reaching. Now, uh, Spencer and colleagues in a 2009 publication report that Schooner and colleagues in an earlier publication attempted to implement this dynamic field model of preservative reaching in a robot. But something interesting happened. The behavior of the robot was actually different than what we observe when we um, test uh, human infants in these preservative reaching um, experiments. The robot didn't mimic the A not B error like human infants do. Instead, the robot just kind of jiggled back and forth, unable to decide where to reach, whether for the toy's original location or for its new location. So what was going on here? Well, neither of the reaching signals, Clark thinks, was strong enough within the dynamic field um, to win out. So we needed a way of boosting the signal, turning up the gain on these signals. So they enriched the dynamic model that they were trying to implement into this robot um, by raising the resting level of the dynamic field during the response phase, kind of turning up the volume of the field or turning up the gain on the field during the response phase of the task when the robot has to reach for either location A or B. This way, even a very small increase in uh, the A or B response um, would cause the appropriate uh, activation level to cross the threshold and initiate the right reaching response. This is kind of like turning up attention in the same way you might turn up the volume on your music player, right? That's what we mean by gain here. We're just making the signal stronger by turning up the gain. Now, um, if we think about this in terms of the human brain, um, we're talking about something that sounds very much like attention, and perhaps in the human brain this is realized or implemented by the selective um, increasing or decreasing of the gain of certain populations of neurons in the prefrontal cortex. And that could be how attention is mediated to generate this or that response in human, um, in human infants. Now, uh, mediating attention, in this way, uh, anything to do with the prefrontal cortex, in fact, is fairly um, high-level cognitive representation heavy stuff. So Clark is saying that maybe we can have the best, both, uh, best of both worlds here. Clark seems to be optimistic that um, there is still room, or rather, there is room for both the dynamic and the more traditional notions of representation and computation here. Of course, I am passing over a lot of the details uh, that Clark discusses at the end of this point of discussion, and that's because I want to move on to the final point. Nonetheless, I think Clark is uh, correct, and I think throughout this whole chapter, if you haven't already noticed by now, Clark does a very good job of a very good job of um, taking the strengths of both approaches, of focusing in where different approaches towards studying the mind complement one another rather than contradict one another. This is certainly one of those uh, cases, and indeed he does this quite successfully, successfully throughout the entire book. Um, in any case, if you have any, of the, any questions about some of the material that I've kind of glossed over, let me know. But now we're going to come to the final point of discussion, which is cognitive incrementalism, and whether this is the biggest issue concerning the material that we've discussed in this chapter and the uh, previous chapters. So let's take a look at that now. All right, so what is cognitive incrementalism all about? Well, basically, cognitive incrementalism concerns the relationship between the low-level strategies for perception and action uh, and higher-level, more cognitive strategies. Uh, what is the connection between the kinds of problem solving that dynamicists study, the low level stuff, versus the kind of things that more traditional cognitive scientists study, like the more cognitive stuff. Well, um, the, the, the view right now in embodied cognition circles 
and this is where we come to this question of cognitive incrementalism, is that the human mind, something complicated like the human mind, uh, is built upon a, an evolutionarily older um, set of basic embodied embedded strategies. Basically, evolution has added these uh, bells and whistles so that we get more and more complicated uh, complicated cognitive systems. Uh, Daniel Dennett refers to this as a sort of ratcheting effect, right, where we uh, successively build upon more fundamental, more fundamental um, mental components, if you like. Um, so there's a principle of continuity here, like we saw earlier. This uh, issue of incrementalism raises the idea of continuity again, and of course, um, you know, some dynamicists, probably all dynamicists, or a great many of them don't think that there is any real difference between these low-level strategies and high-level cognition. Um, the key term is uh, no difference. Uh, what kind of difference? Is there no difference at all? Um, or is there some difference that perhaps dynamicists are overlooking? Um, because it is true uh, that not all cognitive systems are like this. It's true that even outside of embodied cognition, there is a general consensus that the more complicated, um, high-level reasoning, uh, problem-solving uh, abilities that humans have are built upon older, evolutionarily speaking, and more fundamental cognitive and perceptual machinery. But there are cognitive processes that don't seem to depend on uh, these kinds of uh, basic tweaks to our sensory motor capabilities. They seem to involve novel and independent processing systems. And one of these, which we've already briefly talked about in this class, is the dual visual system. You can take a look at an interesting uh, bit of discussion about the dual visual system in box 7.3 in Clark, if you like. And I'm not going to go into that uh, box in detail. And I'm not even going to go into the dual visual system hypothesis in great detail, um, other than to provide a brief recap of what it is. Now, uh, in the literature, you usually see this uh, as attributed to uh, Milner and Goodale. Um, of course, they were building on the earlier work of Ungerleder and Mishkin. And basically, the consensus on the visual pathway in the human brain nowadays is that once information reaches the occipital cortex, it can take one of two routes, depending on what the information is being used for. One route goes to the parietal cortex and one route goes to the temporal cortex. Uh, if we're talking about conscious visual experience uh, or offline visual reasoning, which is like using your imagination, verbally reporting what you are seeing, you know, uh, I see this lamp, I see this coffee cup, I see this chair over here that I'm resting my laptop on that you cannot see. Um, we are using the ventral visual processing stream. That is, uh, we are using what uh, Ungerleder and Mishkin and Milner and Goodale have called the what pathway. However, online visual motor reasoning depends upon the dors dorsal visual stream, the where pathway. This is not consciously accessible. It's what we use, as I discussed in an earlier video, to coordinate our actions when reaching out uh, to pick up objects or open doors. Right? It seems to you, perhaps, that if you want to reach out and pick up a coffee cup or open a door, let's go with a coffee cup since I have one here, uh, that you see the coffee cup, you consciously identify it, and you consciously direct your arm and your hand to grasp the cup, and that what you are consciously doing is affecting your action or causing your action. But that's not quite true. Um, the uh, re actual reaching for the cup is handled by the dorsal stream, which is um, operates online but is not accessible to conscious awareness. And we know this from studies of blind sight. So if you are curious about learning more about that, I will provide a link in the video description to an interesting video on blind sight. Um, it's an interesting phenomenon where uh, there is some damage to the um, to the ventral visual stream, perhaps in one hemisphere, such that you're blind in one eye, 
you have no phenomenal visual experience, but you still do better beyond chance of reaching for the correct object that an experimenter tells you to reach for, say a coffee cup versus um, a pencil in the visual side of your visual field where you do not have any phenomenal uh, visual uh, experience going on. So uh, these people are seeing without seeing. Uh, very strange, the, these people who suffer from blind sight. So that's an interesting piece of evidence for this. Lots of other evidence, but blind sight is the most interesting one. And I'll link you to a cool video that you can watch about blind sight. But here, <coughs> excuse me, it seems that what has happened is that nature has not, in fact, added uh, successive bells and whistles onto um, onto a basic sensory motor capacity. Nature has added a functionally novel uh, and functionally independent visual pathway, the ventral pathway. The dorsal pathway is probably older. Um, but the ventral pathway is functionally novel. It does something different uh, than what the dorsal pathway does. And it's functionally independent. Um, it is not subserved. The ventral pathway is not subserved by the dorsal pathway. It can operate independently of the pathway. Um, we see that kind of dissociation in blind sight, where it, it doesn't operate, but the dorsal pathway works fine. And there are probably other cases where the dorsal pathway uh, is perhaps damaged, uh, so that you cannot reach out and um, you know, grasp the correct object, but you could still look at it and visually identify it, right? So because of this double dissociation, we know that these are functionally uh, dissociated, they're independent, um, and that uh, they, the, the ventral pathway is functionally novel. It does something different. It's, it's, it's a system that we have in addition to the, the other pathway that's not built on top of that pathway. Now, why is the Clark bringing all of this up? Well, because it raises the issue of cognitive incrementalism, namely an issue concerning cognitive incremental, incrementalism is it the right way to look at everything that's going on in the mind? Um, probably not uh, in all cases. We don't know because as Clark is arguing here, um, there is a lot of empirical uncertainty as to how, uh, how much uh, cognitive incrementalism can do for us. It clearly, uh, clearly there's cognitive in incrementalism going on in some cognitive systems but probably not in all of them, like the dual visual system. So, perhaps we can still make sense of this question uh, by doing further empirical work. Um, I mean, uh, this is all still very muddy water. Um, I, it's possible that inputs uh, offline or, or offline um, uh, features can be repurposed by another system. So, um, you know, there's a kind of perceptual game of tag going on, even though these systems operate in, uh, in, um, independently from one another, the dual visual systems. There is a sort of game of tag that goes on between them when you do reach out for a coffee cup or reach out to open a door. And we have other capabilities that are clearly novel that uh, may or may not be built upon other systems, like our linguistic faculties. There's a question of cognitive in incrementalism there. Um, and there's a question, there's a question uh, of the extent to which those faculties allow us to repurpose yet other systems. So the, uh, the question of cognitive incrementalism, I guess what I'm trying to say in a very roundabout way, is not just empirical. It certainly is empirical, but it's um, perhaps also, also conceptual. Uh, it depends on how we... Uh, conceive of not only uh, what particular neural systems are, uh, what counts as a neural system, but what it's doing for other systems and how it's doing it. So this is an open question, and I think that I'm going to leave it there for today. So let's wrap it up. I actually have a few announcements before we wrap it up today, so let's cover those before I say goodbye. All right, so if you've already taken a look at the slides before watching this lecture, then you know that I have planned to change things up for the remainder of the term. 
for my next lecture, which I expect I will have delivered uh, either tomorrow or Saturday, it's not going to be a lecture on any of the material. What I've actually decided to do is um, do a lecture on uh, how to approach your essay assignment for this class, because I realized I did not include that in the syllabus uh, in the course outline, and I probably should have. So what I'm going to do is cut a chapter from the Clark textbook, and the next lecture will technically be this week's lecture, uh, but there will only be one lecture, and it will all be about your essay. How to choose a topic, how to approach writing it, what the grading uh, scheme will be, so on and so forth. Um, I will also be getting your second critical responses done over the weekend, and I will assign your third response. Uh, of course, uh, I'm, doing, I'm placing so much emphasis on the essay because I'm changing up a few other things. Um, I was initially have, uh, planning to have you write um, a final exam that would be a little bit like the midterm. I have decided not to do that. Um, I've decided, rather, that the essay will count as your final exam. So, the final exam will be dropped from the syllabus, the final take-home, and the essay assignment will replace that. So, it'll be like a final take-home essay. Um, the chapter that I will be dropping is chapter 11, so we're not going to read chapter 11. We will still read the conclusion. Uh, but I'm dropping a chapter and I'm having, I'm simplifying the final exam by having you just do the essay as your final. Because you've been working on critical responses and I feel like you're probably all more suited to producing an essay. Um, and I think you probably all get a little bit more out of it since there's so much in this book to cover. I don't know how useful it would be just to test you on a, 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 a very broad uh, you know, selection of the material, I think you'll get more out of um, doing your own kind of deep dive in an essay on a question or a topic that has stood out to you as you read this book. Um, so, that's how we will do that. Of course, I will re-weight uh, other assignments, uh, and I will share all these details in an updated syllabus, which you will have for Monday. Uh, I may also drop one of the critical responses. You know, you were initially uh, supposed to write five of them. I think I'll probably just have you do four. And then if anybody wants to, uh, if they did, you know, say badly on one of their responses, they could still submit a fifth one as a kind of makeup critical response to try and boost the grades a little bit. So um, I want to hear from you guys. Do these changes sound good to you? If they do, let me know. Um, but this is how I'm planning on doing things. So um, hopefully this is just going to make everyone's lives easier. Um, I know it will make my life easier. And I'm fairly certain that all of you are probably as busy or possibly more busy than I am. So I imagine this will make your lives easier as well. But uh, that's the plan. That's what we'll do. Um, so, just to reiterate, uh, the next lecture is on the essay assignment, which will replace your final exam. We're going to drop uh, chapter 11. Um, after the essay lecture, we'll get back onto our uh, regular lecture, lecture schedule with chapter 8. Um, you'll have your grades for critical response due soon, and I am about to assign critical response number 3, for those of you who have been wondering about that. All right, that's it for now. Again, uh, I hope you guys are all doing well. I hope everyone's taking care of themselves and taking care of each other. Um, if you have any questions, get in touch, let me know. Uh, otherwise, I will see you next time for my lecture on your essay assignment, which is also now your, your take-home final. Okay, all right. Take care, everybody, and I'll see you next time. Bye for now.